Good evening, everybody. How are you? How are you? How are you? Sorry there's been a bit of a mess up with um, the timing on this. Christ, that's a lot of light, in it? Do we really need all that light? <laughs> Do we actually need that amount of light? Maybe not. Let's just turn it a little bit that way. Um, so welcome to this Body Image Live. Yes, yeah, sorry about the last couple of days. It's been really, really crazy. Um, but here we are finally on Wednesday. And um, how are you all feeling? How are you all feeling? If this is your first time joining the Body Image Live, then do go back and listen to um, the last four um, because we've covered so much ground and we've talked about a lot and people have had some real sort of epiphanies or epiphanies, as Kay says. And, um, and I've just loved reading your comments um, whether they're still with the struggle or with people that are having little breakthroughs, uh, whatever. It's just been so brilliant. Uh, uh, not only sharing the stories that other people have shared with us, but also, um, yeah, just just your, your comments just generally underneath the lives. So, what are we doing here? What are we doing? We're just trying to share our stories to hopefully give all of us something to think about by listening to somebody else's morning. Hi, Natasha. Hi, Shelley. By listening to other people's difficulties, we can sometimes get these really weird moments of clarity for ourselves. And where this all comes from is, and those that have been here every week know this, so I'm sorry if I repeat myself, but... Um, Years ago, I went to Overeaters Anonymous, which is just like the other fellowships, a, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, all of them, where there is no like cross-sharing. People share if they want to. And then when they share, um, the other people listening in the group try and hear for the similarities and not the differences, because it's the similarities that bring us together and take us out of the echo chambers of our mind. You know, there is nothing as as quite as fantastic as our own minds and quite as awful. <laughs> the Laura too. We can go into an echo chamber and really believe that we're the only people thinking the way that we think and the only people struggling in the way that we're struggling. And um, yes, I, I always liken my self-loathing over the years now that I have so much more understanding I I see it as a familiar anxiety where I can feel safe in that anxiety because I know it well and I know the twists and turns and I know how I'm going to feel and I know how to punish myself and I know how to how to distract from whatever else it is that's going on and I can go to a place of self-loathing because it's familiar and that you know I said this a couple of weeks ago that was just a huge huge moment for me years ago with one particular therapist it was at the same time that Mark in case you're new to him Mark's my husband he's been uh, 20 years sober went to rehab 20 years ago and in out whilst he was in rehab I was trying to give up smoking and um I had a therapist help me because I just couldn't give up. And he said, he said, the, the actual physical addiction to the nicotine is over in three to four, three, three to five days. After that, it is the familiarity, familiarity of the habit. But also it's a familiar anxiety, an anxiety that you are not yet ready to let go of. And I was like, what do you mean? Smoking is brilliant for my anxiety. I feel anxious, I feel nervous, I feel terrible, I have a fag, I feel better. Because the only thing that's made you feel better is that you have satisfied your addiction for the nicotine. But within minutes after that, your heart rate rise, you'll actually become more anxious, but it's an anxiety that you know. It's a familiar anxiety, and that is less scary than an anxiety you don't know how to deal with. It took me ages to work that out, I can tell you. I didn't skip out of that room going, oh, right, that's the meaning of it all. But over the years, it's dropped more into my brain and I have more understanding of it. It's like, oh, I'm slipping to that familiar place, you know, of 
I hate how fat I am. I hate how thin I am. I hate that I've got small eyes. I hate that my eyes are too big. I hate that my hair is curly. I, I hate that I've got straight hair, fizzy hair, da, da, da. We all know all of that stuff within the big scheme of the world and of, of our lives are, t are tiny things. But if we make them really, really huge, we don't have to think about the other stuff. You know, and it can be an ex I remember years ago somebody saying to me, notice... Every time you go on a diet, try and notice how you might get 10 pounds, half a stone away from your goal, right? Goal. I hate a goal. And you'll start eating again. Dismiss this person. What the hell are they talking about? They don't know what to do. It wasn't till years later. Everything takes... You. There's a theme running here, right? It's like everything that I'm ever told that is truly genius takes me fucking years to actually absorb it, process it, and then use it. It takes years. I'm always hoping with these chats that somebody gets something from what I'm saying a bit quicker than I did. Very slow on the uptake. Um, anyway, it wasn't years till years later when I had dieted my way to obesity, i.e. go on a diet, come off a diet, lose weight, go on a diet, come off the diet, put on weight and a bit more. <laughs> it's always a bit more. And it wasn't till, you know, one day that I realised, oh my God, it's true. Every time I start to get to a place of like what this holy grail is, whether that's nine stone, a size 10, whatever, I, I would, um, what's it called? Not catastrophize. What's it called when you smash, it, smash into something on purpose? What's it called? What's the word I'm looking for? What's the word? Well, you know what I mean. I would ruin it. I would ruin it. What is it when you do that thing? Sabotage. I would self-sabotage. I would sabotage. And um, eventually I realised that there was so much that I connected to my weight. So I was like... I was going to get more acting jobs if I was slimmer. I was going to get a better boyfriend if I was slimmer. I was going to be able to be a better friend if I was slimmer. I had attached so many excuses, so many different things that I wanted in life. I could give a reason for not doing and not getting there, and that reason was my weight. And then... What was so petrifying was when I got to the ideal weight, the nine stone four or whatever it was I was going for, and the size 10. And I felt the worst I'd ever felt. I wasn't joyful. I wasn't sorting my life out. And it was just like standing in a bare fucking light going, oh shit, there's all this stuff that I don't address because I've always got this excuse in my head. You know, this low, addictive, low self-esteem that can be the reason why I'm not doing anything else, which is, re and really what it was, was low self-esteem that I just needed to work on and I needed to get, you know, so much more honest with myself. And it wasn't that I was consciously dishonest, it was just that I didn't have any consciousness of what it was I was bloody doing. So, oh, and the reason I'm not reading anything out today is because I thought I would just share a bit more because each week, if this is your first week, I've read out somebody's body story. story. So I thought today it would be good if I shared a bit about my own as well. A few people have asked me to. Um, yeah, and also, I just wanted to say to you as well tonight, you can just ask me any question around body image, body confidence, hating your body. Obviously, I'm not a professional, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a weight management expert, I'm not anything like that. All I can do is share with you my own experience. And also, like I say every week, this isn't about weight. This isn't about whether you are overweight or whether you... This is just about general hating your body. Because somebody could be, like I've said often in, in these lives, haven't I? I've met some of the most beautiful, deemed the most beautiful people, you know, models and actresses and movie stars. 
And so many of them hate their bodies. In fact, my homeopath said, the people that have the most body issues are my most attractive clients. So it isn't really about what you actually look like. It's about what are you escaping from? What else are you escaping from? That's what I had to ask myself. What are you escape? What are you, why are you running into this tunnel that is so familiar where you can just say, oh, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this. I look, 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 I look. Uh, Samantha, I feel these chats are more about mental health and acceptance than weight. Well, brilliant, because it, who would want this to be about weight? Because weight is irrelevant. Many people here will have got to a weight or will be a weight that somebody somewhere has plucked out of the sky and said, this is the weight you should be, and still have a gaping great hole of sadness or loneliness or self-loathing in them. The number on the scale will not fucking change that now you know some people might say well you know I went to, went to Weight Watchers for a year you know for a year and I got down to that nine stone and you know I felt amazing and absolutely you can but how long does it actually last that people stay feeling amazing stay with that maintained weight maintain that weight without looking at what's gone on in their head as well. I think if you look at what's gone on in your head as well, then you have more of a chance. But an awful lot of people just go straight back to where they were. And one particular slimming company that I know said, um, they said this to me, they said, yeah, we just know that people are going to sign up and then lose weight. And then we know we'll get them again in the summer. And then we know we'll get them again at Christmas. And then we'll get them again in New Year. They know. They know exactly how it works, you know. Um, Samantha, you've helped me so much. I don't weigh myself anymore. Brilliant, because you've helped me realise that the scales do not matter. The scales really don't. But feeding yourself in a way that energises you and gives you good skin and hair and sparkling eyes and energy to go for a walk and energy to jump up and dance that is so important that of that I think is so important if we can shift away from standing on the scales and counting calories and we can go into counting chemicals like how much of what I'm eating here is ultra processed food with how many chemicals that's going to leave me hungrier than when I fucking started this meal. Um, the intuitive eating I'm trying to set up for next week. I'm hoping to get this person next week so we can do a, a good old live about intuitive eating. But meanwhile, do look it up, get yourself familiar with it so that when we do the live, you can ask questions about about it because intuitive eating is really, I think, I really believe is the only way forward. Where you go back to eating when you're hungry and not eating when you're not hungry and rather like a child, we, we teach children, it's a process of unlearning with children, isn't it? We want them to eat at certain times and we want them, you know, we soothe them with sweets and chocolates and we mess it all up for them. We really mess it all up. We make too much of a thing about food. Oh, aren't you good? You'll have that. Oh, no, you haven't been good. You're not having that. All of that stuff. We mess up. All of our thinking gets messed up around food and it becomes emotional and it becomes a thing of bribery and punishment. Good food, bad food. All that shit is kicked out the window with intuitive thinking, intuitive eating. Sometimes... You will put on a bit of weight when you first start intuitive eating, but eventually you will lose that weight and you will become a natural healthy weight because you'll be eating right for your body. Um, nutrition. Don't ever think about a calorie. Just don't think about it. Don't think about it. It, it doesn't mean if it's meaningless. It's a load of old rubbish. Just look at your plate for colour and whole foods and fibre and protein and and then eat how you want you know um so i'm going to open the floor now anyone like to ask me any questions or something they might be struggling with or something they might want to ask me that they know that i've done whatever you want <laughs> 
Steph Shorts, I don't drink, smoke, go out much, so bad food is my treat. Got to eat healthier though. Okay, I love this statement. Bad, bad food is my treat. Bad food is my treat. Let's just really think about those words. Bad food is my treat. First of all, let's never say bad food again, right? Just don't say it. Because what comes along with bad food is what? Shame and guilt. And what comes with shame and guilt and need to medicate those feelings? What happens when we medicate those feelings? If you don't use alcohol or sex or shopping or... And if your drug of choice is food, you go back to food. So... First of all, Steph, never say bad food again. Right, just try that. Just say, to, just say, I am going to do everything I can not to say bad food. I still have to correct myself all the time. I had to correct myself earlier. I was saying bad. I have to, it's, it's, it's a, it takes a while, but you literally, you literally just keep correcting that. And so you say bad food is my treat. Okay. So I'm imagining that when you say bad food, give me some examples of what the bad food is, Steph. Just give me, Steph, give me some examples of what the bad food is and then I'm going to give you some options. Um, you, you, and I will really try. What's a really good thing to say is, I am going to, I choose... I'm going to choose what suits me better, right? And make it a positive statement rather than I'm going to really try. You're already saying I'm not really going to do it. <laughs> but I'm going to try. <laughs> um, so it's like I, I always look at I'm going to really, really try. <laughs> it's like I'm going to really try. I'm going to, I'm going to really try. I'm going to really try. I'm, I'm going to really try. I'm going to really try. You see, whatever way you say it, it's like still you're just going to try. Whereas if you say, I am going to make better choices for myself so that I feel really energetic because I want more energy and I want to sleep better and I want to look better, not lose weight, but I want to look better because I have more vitality and more energy and more sparkle and, and I'm going to reduce my risk of illness and all that stuff. And when you really get into it and you start eating in a way that gives you energy, it is very, very powerful. Like now I'll go, God, oh, that, that cake looks really nice. Do I really want it? Wow. I know that about an hour later, I'm going to probably feel like really sleepy and stuff. No, maybe I'll have one tomorrow. You know, that's what I do. And I make the choices. And if it's like, oh, no, do you know what I do? I'm going to sit down. I'm going to have that cake. I'm really going to enjoy it. And nothing is off the list for me. Nothing. If I really, really want a McDonald's tonight, I will have one. But I won't have one every night, you know. Um, yeah. So, Steph, have you got any examples of what you think is bad food? What you say is the bad food that is your treat? Because if you're eating bad food, okay, now that I'm using your words, I'm presuming that part of the reason why you say it's bad is because you end up feeling bad about having had it either physically or emotionally or mentally you think oh god I hate myself why did I have that that was so bad and if that's true that that's how you feel well then is it a treat is it a treat if it's bad because a treat to me is something that makes me feel better now now a um let me think of like a really like totally junky food so the other day I had about eight in one go <laughs> yep I really did this Krispy Kremes right only the ring donuts but I had eight in a row and I know why I had them it was I was angry I was upset I was frustrated with a situation and I, I just shoved down a load of donuts right because I was feeling down and I wanted to have this done. I didn't care. And all of the things that I would usually use in that situation went out the window. 
So I would usually say, have said to myself, if you know, oh God, what are you, are you sad? Are you down? Are you what? What's going on? What, what's going on with yourself? Have a word with yourself. Maybe give myself a hug, or whatever. And it certainly, you know, I, you know, I would have said, all oh, I want, don't. I would have had one, and that would have been fine. But to have eight wasn't a treat. It was, as far as I'm concerned, it was self harming. Because if I'd stopped for two minutes, this bad food that I was giving myself as a treat because I was feeling really shit um, wasn't a treat because I felt physically revolting. About an hour later, I was literally in pain in my stomach. I couldn't get over that I'd done it. I kept... You know, and the next day I just felt like so, oh, I just felt horrible when I woke up in the morning because I had them quite late at night. I felt bloated, I felt disgusting. Where was the treat? The treat wasn't there. You know, it just it just wasn't there. Sometimes when I'm being like really lazy and I just, I am so lazy, honestly, guys, with my own food. I cook lovely stuff for other people. It's just for me, I'll, just, oh, I'll have a bit of that on the bread and I just try really hard to be good to myself. And the other day I was just like, oh, God, I'll just have a bit of rice cakes and peanut butter rice cakes of the devil. They really are. And then I just stopped myself and I thought of you guys and I thought of you guys saying this, to me, that you'd done the same. And I would be saying to you, well, what, what did you really want? Now, I'm really lucky because I love things like tahini. And like if Dina comes around and makes one of her gorgeous salads with all the different cabbages and the carrots and the parsley and the chives and the garlic, tahini and lemon juice, olive oil, nice warm bread. I'm going to eat every bit of that. It's a massive treat. But, you know, too often I won't do that for myself. Anyway, so I was thinking of you guys. I was going to have this rice cake and peanut butter and I had this. And remember, I'm not thinking about weight at all. I never think about my weight. And this is never about weight for me. It's like, it's not, I just don't do it anymore, the weight. But it was about how was I going to feel. So I made this salad. Oh, my God. I put it in a beautiful bowl. I sat down at the table. I just munched and munched and munched. I put a podcast on. And that was such a treat. Because afterwards, energised, jumping around. Da, da, da. Now, m much more often I do that than I don't do that. But in the old days, the dark days, I'll never do that for myself. I was just constantly grabbing bits and pieces of rubbish and shit, shoving down a bag of crisps, eating a bag, three bags of quavers because they weren't filling enough, thinking I'm treating, treating, treating myself, having whatever I want. It's not a treat. If you don't feel better afterwards, it's not a treat. Now, as I'm biting into the Krispy Kreme and it's soft and it's doughy and it's fatty and it's sweet in that second, or the eight minutes for the time it took me to eat them all, um, it, it, I, it's totally, I'm totally enjoying it. <laughs> Lovely. But it's like eight minutes. And then what? Bloated, disgusting, feeling, ugh, feeling my mouth's all like oily. You know, so that's the way to think about it. It's like I was saying the other week, was my first thought, second thought. First thought is... I'm feeling down. I'm going to treat myself with three boxes of Pringles and a couple of donuts. And then say to yourself, will, how will I feel afterwards? Will I have treated myself or will I have hurt myself? Because I think a treat is to have like, you know, anything that makes you feel nice. And sometimes that's a beautiful cake. Sometimes it's a beautiful salad. Sometimes it's a gorgeous roast chicken. Um... But if it's consistently food, in vertical is bad food, and it's consistently every time you eat it, you've got to say to yourself afterwards, oh, I must be better, I must try harder, I must eat healthier, then you're not treating yourself. You're being you're being mean to yourself. Steph, bread, bread, bread. We were brought up on it with every meal. Being gluten-free restricts me, but crisps too. Now, Steph, it's so funny you should say this. This is my weakness, bread. Bread, bread, bread. Absolutely I get it. Do not put a hot baguette in front of me because there's not going to be any of it left. Do not put a nice white slice in front of me because I'm going to toast it and I'm going to eat it with butter. Do not put... So I get it. I love dough. It would be my last supper would be bread. Um, but of course, the problem is with bread is it's like it makes us hungrier. 
everyone should have, I'm not saying don't have bread, bloody love bread. I have bread every day. But now I make sure I put loads of other stuff with it. I put protein, whether that's chicken, eggs, fish, and uh, not so much fish, don't like fish, um, and veggies and salads and seaweed. And if I want a bag of crisps on the side, I have a bag of crisps. I love to have a bag of crisps in my sandwich sometimes. Um, and that way you're getting, you're filling it because you need protein to stop that hunger. But if you just have loads of bread, loads of toast and butter, the more you have, the more you want to have the bread. But have the best bread. Try and have really good bread. Like on the Mediterranean diet, which the way the Mediterranean eats, why they are so healthy is because they don't have this bread in supermarkets that we have, which will last for years because it's got so much shit in it. You know, it's bread that will go off by the end of the day. You know, so take a walk. Get a fresh loaf of bread. <laughs> Enjoy it. Make Bread is easy to make. If bread is easy. It really is. Maybe I should make some bread. I can show you loads of ways to make bread. In. I mean, there's bread that you don't need to rise. There's bread that you can just... Uh, yes? Sorry, I didn't know you were live. Sorry, darling. Um, yeah, so don't not have your bread, but try not to binge because then it's not a treat. It's a punishment. Um, I won't be long, Mads. That's my daughter. I think she's wanting to watch something with me. Um... Yeah, let's just try and be a bit kinder to ourselves. That's the message. Han H, I've lost over a stone due to stress. I'm five foot eight, seven and a half stone. I'm eating well, but the weight is dropping off me. My heart rate is through the roof. Any tips? I'm like a shell of myself. God. Well, first tip is you must go to the doctor. You know, that's, that's, that's a lot. That's sort of, isn't it? It's like, go to the doctor, because first of all, they'll be able to put your mind at rest. Because your heart rate, you know, may well be up because you're stressed. So go to a doctor and get that checked out first. And then, as far as stress is concerned, there are so many different ways. I mean, the simplest of ways to deal with stress, you know, we had Michael Mosley, Dr. Michael Mosley on the show on Loose Women on Friday. And he said to me, it was like off camera, he goes, nothing helps me, nothing helps me with my stress or anxious feelings everything as much as the breathing the breathing in for four no breathing in holding for four blah 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 you know the square breathing is is he said it's just amazing and he and he was saying that if you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't go back to sleep to use the breathing techniques and a walk first thing in the morning is the most brilliant thing for reducing stress it really is now you might not like walking, but you might like dancing. So put on music and dance. You know, whatever it is that you like, whatever way it is that you like moving your body, move your body. But first, go to the doctor and just get checked up and just make sure that you're okay. Um, and, um, yeah, and it's hard, isn't it, when you've lost weight? Because if you don't want to lose weight and everyone's going, oh, you've lost weight. Oh, look at you, you've lost weight. Great. And you're thinking, well, I didn't actually want to lose weight, you know? Um, it's just as annoying as somebody's being told that they've put on weight. Um, having lost weight unintentionally from a virus, it triggered my anorexia. You think it won't happen to you, but you never know if you're prone to it. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's what I learned uh, when Mark was in rehab, that, you know, eating disorders can be triggered and re-triggered, can't they? And it's something that you always have to be so mindful of. I mean, it's like me. I mean, I don't say I have an eating disorder because I think an actual eating disorder is such a horrendous, difficult, challenging, heartbreaking thing to have. But I've had just on the edge of that very disordered eating and all of that. And I know how much pain and anguish that has caused me in my life and distracted me from living my life. So I do have huge empathy for people that do. And, you know, I don't know if this is your first time here, but because I've said this each week, Overeaters Anonymous is for anyone with disordered eating it is not for just people that overeat and i have sent a couple of people or recommended a couple of people to go to overeaters anonymous when they've come out of um units um for their anorexia and then had no follow-up care and no support and they have really really found it useful 
So you never know, it might be you, for you, it might not be for you. If you want to try over it, it's anonymous, whatever, you, whatever your reason may be. You don't have to be fat, you don't have to be skinny, you don't have to be anything. You can just be messed up about in your head about your body. That's all you need to qualify to go. And you don't have to speak if you don't want to speak. But what they do recommend is that you go for at least six meetings before you make your decision of, as to whether it's right for you or not. When you're there, listen for the similarities instead of the differences. It's like, oh, oh, God, well, she might be 20 stone and worrying about eating, but I see I'm anorexic, so anything she's got to say has got, is, won't chime for me. But it will, because it's about this. It's not about the weight, it's about what's going on up in there. It doesn't cost anything. You can make a donation if you want, 50 pence. I think a lot of people um, donate. And um, also it is online, but there is something very powerful about sitting in a room with other people. But you can go online if you feel worried about that. And, and they're available all the time and you can go around the world. I used to love listening to ones in America because I love the American accent. I'd love to hear the different like, experiences. Fascinating. It's fascinating just to listen to. I mean, you could listen to a load before you went to a meeting and just see if it helps. It really used to soothe me a lot. But anyway, my darlings, um, I have to go now because my daughter is needing me for something. I'm not sure what. <laughs> it might be just to watch um, Housewives of Beverly Hills. I don't know. Um, but anyway, uh, lots and lots of love. Square breathing is fabulous. Thank you, Faith. That's the thing. So um, thank you so much. And um, I will see you tomorrow for Coffee Moaning at 9.30. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe and hit the notification bell. The notification bell, because I do sometimes have to change the timings on this, will mean that you get notified by YouTube about times and all of that. So really, really lovely to see you all and um, sending you so much love and just be kind. And just through the week, when you hear the nasty trolls that you've let live free in your head, don't say to them, shut up, go away, go away, because they won't if you do that. You just have to say, oh, OK, you're there. That's all right. That's all right. It, this will pass. Or oh, I'm noticing what I'm doing there. Hmm. I'm allowing myself to be distracted with really unpleasant thinking about myself. What is it I'm trying to avoid? What feelings am I trying to avoid? Notice and just say to yourself, notice that. Notice that. And eventually, oh, I used to have to do it about 30 times a day. I've got notice that, notice that. Whereas now it's like a couple of times a day sometimes. Oh, notice. Mm, look, what you're off. look what you're up to. Mind you, I had to do a big noticing when I had all those bloody donuts the other day. Oh, God almighty. Anyway. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Lots of love. And I'll see you tomorrow for coffee morning. Mwah.